two different slopes. So what's the first one there? What do you get for the first one there? So you get V is equal to 15 feet per second. And what's this second one come out to be? 20 feet per second. So then if you average them, you get 15 plus 20 over 2, which is what, 17.5 feet per second? OK, so you can take two, run right before and run right after, and take the average. That's one way to find velocity at a given space. OK, so let's say we want to ask something a little different. But I was sorry, that is my mistake. So look, uh, yeah. Uh, they're like, that is remarkably fast or slow, but he seems wrong. OK, so for one second, he's going 20 feet per second. How far is he on? 20 feet. Okay. For another second, he's going 30, so he's on 30 feet, yeah. right? So for another second, he's on 38, for this, he's on 44, right? So if you were to do that, you could estimate how far he's traveled for the first four seconds. For the first four seconds, it would be 1 times 20 plus 1 times 30 times 1 times 38 1 times 44. And it just happens to be 1 because what's the interval? 1, 1, 1, 1. Does the interval have to be 1? No, the interval, we could measure this in tenths of a second or whatever. Even intervals are generally what you want to see. What do I mean by even intervals? It's constant. Things, you can do calculus, like the rules of calculus work with uneven intervals, but what happens to the mathematics? It gets really annoying. It gets really, really annoying. So because you can choose intervals, if you can, choose even intervals. OK, so what would that mean? So for the first four seconds, what would it look like if we wanted to figure out the distance? Distance is rate times time. So the first one was 20 feet per second for how long? One second right there. So if we wanted to keep on going with that, we would have 30 feet per second times, again, one second. So that's what? 30 feet. And then it would be what? 38 feet per second times one second equals 38. And then what would we have? 44 feet per second times what? One second again, and that would be 44. When you add that all together, you get what? 132. So there's one other way to estimate it. We chose for the first second that the speed was 20, right? That's the minimum speed. But here's the thing. What happens to the, excuse me, what happens to the velocity from 0 to 1? What happens to the velocity from 0 to 1? It goes up. So what's the minimum? What would be a, a floor? What would be the minimum? 20. But what would be the maximum? 30. So instead of doing 1 times 20, what could we do? 1 times 30, and then 1 times 38, and then 1 times 44, and then 1 times 48. So that would be the maximum. That would be the maximum. Because do we have any idea what happens to the velocity in between? No. We don't. So this is how we estimate it. Yeah? I'm confused. Is it at 1 second, isn't it 30? It starts times what? 1 second. And then what's next? 44, and then what? Is it 48? 48 feet per second feet per second, it's one second. Again, does it have to be one second? Does it have to be one second? No. That's important that you realize that. Is it really nice when it's one second? And I write correctly? Mm, yeah. So it's feet, feet, and 48 feet. The point being that it, we, it may have gone 160 feet, realistically, realistically, if the function stays within bounds there. What does this mean? It means the total distance, the actual distance traveled, is somewhere between 132 and 160 feet. Visually, what did we just do? We just did this right here. This is literally what we did visually. I had a function right here. Let's say, I had a, let's say this function was modeled by this. I'm just going to draw really crude right here. Here it is. Do, 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 do. So what do we think the lower bound of this area is right here? The lower bound we found was what? 132, right? What was the upper bound? 160. As what we're going to do in the course of the coming weeks and months is work with finding the area of this smooth curve. How many rectangles could you theoretically make if you wanted to, if you had calculus? An infinite number. The lower bound and the upper bound get closer and closer together, and they approach the actual area under the curve. The actual area under the curve. Now let's look at the green right here. How do you know, based on this picture, that it's a underneath the actual? There's a little piece that it doesn't contain right here, right? There's a little piece it doesn't contain right here. There's a little piece it doesn't contain right here. And there's a little piece it doesn't contain right there. So it's a underestimate. But what do we know about the, uh, the yellow right here? It's above, it's above, it's above, it's above. So the point is, we're going to learn how to take an infinite number of rectangles and add them together and thereby get the actual area under any curve. The actual area under the curve. First part of calculus, rates of change. Second part of calculus, 
area. If you spin these things, can you create three-dimensional things and do volumes? Oh yeah, area can be extended in many places. So what does this look like mathematically? You take more rectangles, right? This is the same data. Look, here's 020, 130, 238, 344, and 448. So theoretically, if you wanted to do the left hand, what's the new distance? What's the new delta in time? 0.5. So if we wanted to do the left hand, it would be 0.5 times 20. 0.5 times, so 0.5 times this, 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 and this, and that. And then if you wanted to do the right hand, what would you do? 26, 30, 35, 38, 42, 44, 46, 48. It's a lot of repetitive multiplication and addition. This is what it looks like when you do it out. What are you doing? We already said it out loud. Look, we said it. 0.5 times 20. 0.5 times 26. You add it all together, what do you get? 146.5. Oh, what do you have in here? 0.5 times the next one. Remember, you start at the 26 instead? Are they getting closer together? It used to be 130 to 160. Now what is it? 146 to 154. Now, could you factor out the 0.5 out of all of these to make it easier to type into your calculator? Yeah, you're going to do that a lot with 0.5 times that, because it's the same width. Remember what I said? Can calculus work with different widths? So theoretically, different widths can work to make estimates. But because this is the same width, what can you do? Factor it out. Is that going to be helpful when you're typing things in your calculator? Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Now, theoretically, how many subdivisions is this? This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If we wanted a better estimate, maybe we go to 16, or 32, or 64, or a billion. Are you going to type that in by hand? No. no. We're going to learn how to use calculus to make you go real fast. Yes? Um, can you do stuff like that? Absolutely. Left, there are certain cases where you, where you will be able to do an analysis and say, oh, this is definitely an underestimate or definitely an overestimate. But generally, speak, but generally speaking, don't make the automatic assumption all the time because functions can be both concave up and concave down or increasing and decreasing and flip. You're estimating the velocity at time equals two. You found the velocity from one to two and then you found the velocity from two to three. And then what did you do with those two things? You averaged them, right? So theoretically, you could find the left hand, you could find the right hand, and then you could average them, and that's a pretty good guess, right? Geometrically, if you want to draw a different picture instead of rectangles, there's another shape you could draw that might be better. So here's the first rectangle, here's the second rectangle. What shape could I draw which would be an average of the two? Just trying to see if it's ready. You can connect two points. There are only two. What happens if you connect these two points? What's this shape called right there? If I did that? It's a question. Trapezoid. It's a trapezoid, right? So theoretically, is there a way to do it with trapezoids? Absolutely. The trapezoid will actually be the average of the two. So sometimes is that better? Sure. Is it always better? No, because what can functions do? Pretty much anything you want. You can come up with a function that breaks all of these rules either way. But sometimes later, not sometimes, but later, I'll ask you to do a trapezoid. Remember how to find the area of a trapezoid? You have height one and height two in a base. What do you do with the two heights? And then you do the, yeah, you average the heights. You average the heights. You average them. Okay, so let's just make sure we can do.